of our television audience who may have just joined us. I want to tell you that you are here with us at the Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum in Yorba Linda, California with uh, a program presented jointly by the National Archives, the Richard Nixon Foundation, and the Central Intelligence Agency. This is our second panel of the program. And before we get into it, I want to remind the um, members in our audience of the, of the Association of Former Intelligence uh, Officers that there will be a reception for you immediately after this program in our great hall. So I hope all of you will, uh, will attend that. You have heard uh, about intelligence in the 1973 Arab-Israeli war from the standpoint of the analysts, from their perspective. And now, in our next panel, we're going to hear about intelligence from the standpoint of the policy perspective. And our chair of that panel is Fred Hutchinson. Fred is a former uh, CIA of, uh, intelligence officer. He retired in 1995 to work as an independent con consultant until he returned to the CIA after 9-11. As an independent contractor and consultant for the CIA today, he continues to work on Near Eastern Affairs. He holds a master's degree in public law and government from Columbia University. He also graduated from the Command and General Staff College and the Defense Institute and is a distinguished graduate of the Ranger School. What impressed me among all his awards, and they're multiple, is his senior parachutist badge. <laughs> <laughs> so you know this guy is amazing, and he's had an amazing career, ladies and gentlemen, Fred Hutchinson. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm going to run this just slightly different. I want to draw your attention to this document right here, which tells you in some more detail about the background of William Quant sitting here to my left, and next to him, Greg Treverton. Um, and at the end, or, or in, in, in the middle there, is Emil Knockley, whom you were, became acquainted with in the last panel. Now, this uh, segment is to talk about the policy perspective. And that's how I became involved in this event, the 1973 Arab War, or the October War, as I frequently referred to it. The, I was in, I lived in the Middle East before, during, and after the 1967 war. Uh, a few months before the 1967 war, I. Uh, toured the Lebanon, Syria, Jordan uh, areas and made my, some appraisals for my own purposes and my employers uh, of the situation, uh, growing unrest, growing unease. Uh, the war occurred, 67 war occurred, and then I returned and this time for about a three week uh, review in Israel of the, each of the major battles and discussions with the intelligence officers and the military commanders. I came away from that with a distinct impression uh, that the Israelis were really on a high. They had surprised the Arab armies in the 1967 war and they thought that all of the chaos that they created amongst the Arab forces was due to their inferiority of manpower, equipment, and leadership. Now, there was a great deal of the shortcomings of the Arab armies so uh, arrested as on those issues. But the Israelis came away with a very exaggerated sense of themselves. Um, I returned briefly to the United States uh, in 1968 um, and I found that many of our military people, I didn't talk to many intelligence folk at that time, 
uh, shared that same Israeli uh, view of the Arab armies and a rather short-sighted view of what the political strategy might be in the Arab world concerning Israeli occupation of land they had captured in uh, 1956 uh, and then having acquired additional land in 67. I went off then to fight a war in Vietnam, uh, which was kind of my major occupation at the time, Airborne Infantry Ranger Officer. And then when I returned to Washington, I was assigned to the Pentagon partially on the basis of my Middle Eastern specialty, my Middle Eastern knowledge, travel, and experience there. The first thing I encountered was a policy issue. In the chairman's brief almost every morning, there was some intelligence and some policy issues presented concerning U.S. concern that it might be drawn in to the increasing hostilities between the Israelis and the Syrians and the Egyptians uh, on the new 67 borders. I had an idea, which I got the approval of the Secretary of Defense to follow up on, was to draw up a plan for disengagement of the forces and to provide each party with sufficient intelligence that they would uh, be, have confidence that they would not be surprised by a secret military buildup on each side. So I developed that plan, took it over to the Assistant Secretary of State, Cisco, and from there to the NSC. It got to Henry Kissinger, and he thought, well, oh, that's interesting, but I can't persuade these folks to do this. Uh, to disengage their forces and to quit sniping at each other. That's 1972. So in February 73, sort of as a free-floating agent, I floated over to the CIA and joined the office of the Director of Central Intelligence. And I took my little plan with me. And so I got over there and the war happened. And you've heard quite a bit about that. My next role was, as that war ran down, was to resurrect for Dr. Kissinger the plan for the disengagement of forces. That put, got put into play in the diplomatic uh, uh, arena. Uh, Kissinger suggested and browbeat the parties into doing, doing that. We tweaked the plan a bit. And uh, he sent me off to sell it to the parties which gave me an interesting experience to talk to President Sadat and Prime Minister uh, Mayer and various intelligence and army people. The next thing that I got involved in was to propose to the director that we do a director's uh, postmortem on the surprise. And you've heard all about the surprise. You'll find in the declassified documents the proposal, how we tend to do this report, postmortem on our intelligence failure. Failure of warning. Uh, you will also find in there a declassified version of the uh, postmortem report, of which I was a co author. Uh, so I got involved in this in an intelligence agency, but it started from a policy perspective. Now, having set that stage for my own involvement, I now want to move on and ask Bill Quant, who's sitting here, who was in the National Security Council staff at all, throughout this period, and who has a very distinguished academic career, as you can see in this bulletin. So Bill, I would like to uh, hear from you um, as to what some of this looked like from the NSC staff, 72 on through the war. Okay, thank you very much. It's been a, an interesting ex experience to be here today and to hear the producers of intelligence talk because I was a fairly avid consumer of their products and I have had met some of them before, but not all of them. So this is kind of a 40 year later <clears throat> finding the people who were writing these memos that attracted so much of my attention uh, during the war. I was uh, uh, from 1972 on through uh, the next two years, the deputy in the Middle East office uh, working for Henry Kissinger and for the White House on Middle Eastern Affairs. 
Uh, on the, the day before the war began, uh, for circumstances that are not particularly relevant for the, this discussion, I became the director of the office. And with that came this enormous sense of responsibility. When you're the number two, you can always say, well, somebody else is going to have to make the hard calls. But all of a sudden, I thought, oh my gosh, there might be a war on my watch. Because there was actually a lot of detailed information that if you hadn't been through this five or ten times before, and if you didn't have a framework to say, well, we've seen that, we've seen that, we've seen that, it looked pretty alarming. The Egyptians were evacuating hospitals on the front lines. That didn't look too normal to me. Uh, so I got very nervous and started calling around uh, to see what people in the various agencies that I dealt with uh, were thinking, called CIA and INR and State Department and so forth. And the response was almost uniformly, we understand you're a bit upset. My colleagues, had, who my boss's wife had just died and he had to be home with the kids and so I had taken over. And I was upset and uh, it was a very you know, emotional time. Uh, and they said, we're watching the situation and we've seen this before, don't worry. Um, and I thought, well, that's not too reassuring, but I stayed on. And I also got one of these calls the next morning, but I'm not going to tell you about more phone calls. Um, I want to instead reflect on what we can say that's of kind of general significance about intelligence and policy, because policymakers have to work with a lot of different streams of information, one of which is intelligence, but they're also getting diplomatic cables, they're also on the telephone, they're also talking to one another, and all of this is part of the process that results in concrete decisions. And I would say that the, there, there was an intelligence failure uh, involving uh, the 1973 war. Uh, we didn't see it coming, certainly not in time to do anything about it, but it wasn't a classical intelligence failure in the sense of a lack of information. It was rather a failure of imagination. We couldn't imagine that something like this would happen. And I think the reason for that, and I think this went from the top, from the president on down, uh, was that we, we had developed a way of looking at this region. We had a mindset, the term has been used and it's an important one, that was largely forged in the previous Middle East crisis, this is often very common. You look back to the most previous, the, the most intense previous example, and that was the 1967 war, which the Israelis had won hands down uh, very quickly, and had left an impression that they were amazingly competent, and that the Arabs were feckless and totally incompetent. And I would say that it perhaps wasn't quite that explicitly articulated in anybody's mind, but it had left the impression that the Arabs can't do anything militarily to reverse this, and that the key to stability in the Middle East, and this was certainly Kissinger's view, is keep Israel strong so that deterrence will work. We know the Arabs are unhappy, that they're frustrated, they're angry, but until such time as they're prepared to sit down and negotiate and break with the Soviet Union, we just keep stability by maintaining the balance of power. And no rational Arab leader will go to war if he's going to lose the war. We've heard all that. And that was the mindset. And that's why we didn't pick up what were, in fact, quite a few signals that could have been interpreted more accurately. Now, I want to look at three specific aspects of the failure. Just briefly, the failure to foresee the war, even though we did have some good tactical intelligence and some very good human intelligence and some people telling us very bluntly it is going to happen. Second, there was a failure to foresee and to understand the oil embargo and its implications and how that would play out. And I want to say just a word about that because it, it actually is part of the, part of the <clears throat> 1973 war that most affected ordinary Americans. People woke up and thought, my gosh, a crisis in the Middle East affects my daily life. Few of you are old enough uh, to remember what it was like to be in the gas lines in those days, and people didn't like it. Uh, the third issue I want to talk about briefly is the <clears throat> issue surrounding the uh, ceasefire in place and the airlift to Israel. It's 
a little bit technical, but it was actually very important in a sh for a short period. Um, and intelligence did play a role in our, the way that was handled. And the new, docu new documents, incidentally, uh, shed a bit of new light on that. It's been a bit controversial, particularly I've written a version of it that Henry Kissinger doesn't agree with him. So there are different points of view on what happened. His, I must say, is, um, makes him look fairly heroic uh, and puts the blame for certain things on the uh, Defense Department. And I think that probably wasn't. The document supports his view. Yeah. <laughs> Way to go. Um, and then if there's any time, I might mention a, a word or two about the alert at the very end. So first of all, the surprise was not total. We had been, in some sense, forewarned, but we'd had a way of explaining away the warnings. Just the, the most relevant of them uh, were that King Hussein uh, had told us on several occasions that he had information from sources in Syria. In fact, he had the war plan, which he had given to us. And it was on file in the CIA. And <clears throat> he told the Israelis themselves, in fact, he went to Israel and met with Golda Meir in the spring of 1973 and said, there's going to be a war. And you may think they're faking, but they're not. And the Israelis, just as we, when we heard the report of this, said it's, they're faking. They're trying to bluff us into launching a diplomatic initiative to get the Israelis to withdraw uh, from the occupied territories. Uh, and you know, it, it's, it's nothing other than a bluff. But then we had a meeting between President Nixon and General Secretary Brezhnev in San Clemente, not far from here in the summer in which Brezhnev interrupted the normal routine and demanded a special meeting to talk about the Middle East. And he said, I don't know exactly when it's going to happen, but there is going to be a war in the Middle East this fall unless we can do something to prevent it. Now that information I knew and took seriously as I think Kissinger did, not as a precise warning, but he started asking us to watch carefully for any signs that it might be true. I don't believe that this information was shared with the CIA. And this is a problem where policymakers know things that they don't convey to the analysts. <clears throat> and then, of course, we saw the Soviet advisors leaving in the few days before. Uh, and in the very last day, there were uh, very strong signals of uh, that war was a possibility. I can tell you that on October 5th, I was actually quite nervous. Um, but there was this issue that has been mentioned several times. The Israelis didn't seem to be worried. At least they weren't through the day of October 5th. That changed overnight on the 5th to the 6th. And I think what I had heard as a relatively junior <clears throat> but pretty well plugged in person uh, in the policy part of this is that the Israelis would know if there was going to be a war because they had great intelligence and in particular, they had a source high up in Egypt. And they didn't, I didn't know who it was at that time. Uh, Israelis have now said, not, not total unanimity on this, but the, uh, the people I take seriously say they had recruited a very high-ranking Egyptian. He happened to be President, former President Nasser's son-in-law, which makes it even more interesting, uh, and that they were quite sure that if this was for real, they would hear from him, which they did. On October 4th, he demanded a meeting uh, in London with their military intelligence. Uh, military intelligence flew to London, uh, was debriefed by him, uh, went back to Israel, reported to the prime minister, and that's what changed their perception so that the next day we got the message from Golda Meir, actually, there is going to be a war, and it's going to happen by the end of the day today. And that was the message that I received from the Situation Room on the morning of October 6th, when I said, oh my gosh, it really is going to happen, and it is going to be on my watch. So we had, uh, we were misled by the, the relatively calm view of the Israelis until about 12 hours before it all began. The failure to foresee the embargo was a different kind of failure, and it was a, an intellectual failure shared throughout the government with one or two exceptions. We did not understand how the international oil market worked because up until about 1970, 
<clears throat> there was lots of oil sloshing around in the world, and if one country got angry at you and said, we're not going to sell you our oil anymore, you just went and bought oil somewhere else, and the price didn't go up because there weren't shortages. And we'd been through this in 19, the 1953 crisis with Mossadegh. We'd been through it in 1967. And there was a mindset, that, and there was a slogan almost, that oil and politics don't mix. The Arabs have to sell their oil. They can't drink it. But the oil market had begun to change. And there was no longer <clears throat> a big spare capacity anywhere in the world. <clears throat> the Saudis didn't have any extra. Venezuela didn't have any extra. Indonesia didn't have any extra. Everybody was producing all out. So if, in addition to embargoing oil, you also cut the amount of oil on the world market, you were going to ha <clears throat> have an explosion of prices, which is exactly what happened and was not anticipated. And I think it's partly a problem that foreign policy strategists aren't necessarily very good economists. Henry Kissinger is a very smart guy. In fact, on a lot of the politics and grand strategy, he was way ahead of most of the rest of us. But on economics, he was like economics 101 and maybe even worse. Uh, the one person in the room <clears throat> who understood this was Jim Schlesinger, who was a trained econo economist, who had studied oil markets, and I remember in the very first day, and I think it's in the documents we have, that somebody's trying to speculate about what's, what does Sadat expect to get out of this? He's going to lose militarily. And Schlesinger says the only sense it makes is if he thinks that the uh, Saudis are going to impose an embargo and cutbacks of oil. Now, this was about 10 days before they actually did it, but he actually saw that there was a possibility that it could be done, and that would help make sense out of what otherwise looked like an extremely risky strategy for Sadat. And of course, it, it was part of the overall plan to, to bring oil into play. But that one we missed simply because we'd never been anything, through anything like this, and we honestly didn't understand how oil markets work. I think we actually understand much better today, and as a result, we let price go up, and then it comes down, it goes up, it goes down. It doesn't come down very much these days, but we've learned to kind of deal with the volatility of oil markets in a way that simply hadn't been experienced, because for t two decades, we had had very stable and very low prices of oil. The third failure, uh, not failure, but the, the third issue that I want to briefly discuss relating intelligence to policy had to do with a very delicate moment in the diplomacy where Kissinger and Nixon, Nixon's kind of a, an absent figure in this. He's a little preoccupied with something called Watergate, but he's not completely absent. He, is, he doesn't meet with anyone other than Kissinger and one or two other people, but we have some of the records of Kissinger talking with Nixon, and it's clear that Nixon is giving direction. What they want to see by about October 10th or 11th is an early end to the war before it kind of gets out of hand. It was a little bit of a stalemate at that point. They wanted to end with U.S.-Soviet cooperation because they still valued detente, and of course there'd been nothing about oil up through October 11th. Now, the problem was that the Soviets were beginning to resupply the Egyptians and the Syrians and doing it on a scale that looked large. We didn't know the content, but we saw the planes going in. And the question came up of, should we immediately respond with an airlift of our own to Israel? And Kissinger's initial instinct was not if we can get a ceasefire first. We've already told the Israelis we will uh, compensate them for all the losses that they've taken, but if we can end this without directly intervening, it would be better. And so we got the Israelis, under I think a little bit of pressure, to accept the idea of a, an immediate ceasefire in place. They weren't happy with it, but they agreed to it. And the Soviets told us that Egypt would agree as well. And Egypt didn't. Egypt turned it down. And that was what triggered our decision to go with the full-scale airlift, which President Nixon said, if it's, we're going to do it, let's do it all the way. Make it as big as you can, because we'll get as much blame for doing a little one as we will for a big one. Now, we could not have fine-tuned that diplomacy, which ultimately didn't work, although if it had, I think it would have been a better outcome to the war than we got, uh, if we hadn't known that on the ground the military situation had reached this relatively delicate point where a ceasefire in place might be a possibility. And I think that's where the, the daily intelligence by then was actually quite good. 
on what's happening on the battlefield and who's got the upper hand and how vulnerable are the Israelis and so forth. So even though that particular initiative failed, we could not have played it as, as finely uh, in terms of just judgments about almost hour by hour what was possible had we not had good tactical intelligence. Um, finally, on the alert, <clears throat> which you recall, uh, we negotiated ceasefire in place, the Israelis actually violated it, and the Egyptians got quite hysterical because they were about to lose an entire Third Army Corps, which is what, about 45,000 armed men, which would have been a uh, a disaster for, for the Egyptians. Um, on the, the morning that uh, we had, after we had announced this stage three worldwide nuclear alert, which was a fairly dramatic thing to do, intelligence almost got us into trouble because we had a fragment of unevaluated intelligence where we got a part of a message from Moscow to the embassy, Russian embassy in Cairo. Sometimes you can just decode a little bit of a message and the little bit of it said, Soviet troops arrive Cairo 3 p.m. And given our fear that the Soviets were going to send troops in to enforce the ceasefire and the threat that Brezhnev had made that they were going to do that, and the fact that all of their airlift was back in Russia and they had seven airborne divisions on alert, Kissinger turned and said, that's it. They're going in. And he turned to me and one other person said, you figure out where we go in. Because if the Soviets send troops to the Middle East, we have to send troops to the Middle East. And he walked out of the room. I thought, oh my god, this is getting very, very serious and dangerous. An hour later, he came back and said, forget it. He said, I've talked to Dobrynin. It's a misunderstanding. I forgot that we had agreed that 30 Soviet troops and observers, military observers, were going in to observe the ceasefire, just as we were going to send 30 of our unarmed observers to observe the ceasefire. And that's all it's about. And fortunately, we had another way of checking what this was about. But intelligence can sometimes inform you. It can also sometimes uh, mislead you. Okay, I'm going to sum up by saying one last thing. He said, I don't, uh, I don't think that the documents that have just been released radically change anything in our understanding about this crisis, partly because it's been written about a lot. There have been previous releases of documents. But if you are interested in the policy process, the minutes of the Washington Special Action Group meetings, which are now all in there, including ones that I wasn't even allowed to go to as a relative, as a staff member. They had a lot of so-called principles only. For the first time, these are now available. And those are really interesting. Uh, we also have the f tapes of Henry Kissinger's phone conversations with the president, with the Israeli ambassador, with his Soviet, uh, Soviet ambassador, which are extremely interesting. Um, What's missing and probably will be missing for quite a long time is the little bit of an overtone of a nuclear shadow in this crisis. Nobody has mentioned, but on October 8th, we did pick up indications that the Israelis had alerted their Jericho missiles. We didn't know what they put on the end of those missiles, but I can understand why people don't declassify that. But at the time, we had knowledge, Soviets had knowledge, I'm sure the Egyptians had that knowledge that the Israelis had put a surface-to-surface -surface missile on alert uh, and the only sense it could possibly make is if it had a nuclear warhead on top of it. You've heard from others that we had some suspicions that the Soviets also had uh, perhaps put nuclear weapons, but that was frankly never confirmed and I don't think we know for sure if that's true. So there are a few small issues that maybe still can benefit from some additional light but by and large, you've got a, we've got a pretty good picture of what happened in this crisis, at least in terms of how American officials understood it. And despite the, the initial failure to anticipate the war, which was a shared failure and was, a, as I said, a mindset failure, I think we recovered from that fairly quickly. And I give a lot of credit to Kissinger for this, who, who was totally perplexed by what was going on in the first 24 hours and very quickly found his footing, partly because 
communicated with Anwar Sadat directly, and Sadat told him what his intentions were, uh, and Kissinger decided to take him seriously. And from then on, we played our hand with a certain degree of, I think, sophistication and skill so that we would be in a position to launch a diplomatic initiative, which is what the president wanted when this was over. And had we not had good tactical intelligence uh, after the initial failure, we couldn't have done that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we'd like to have a few more remarks from Emil Nockley, whom you met uh, at the last panel. And then anticipating where we'll go from there, we'll move on after this, uh, these comments on the policy aspects to Greg Treverton, who's going to give us a review of uh, the issues that have arisen uh, since 73 uh, of the issues that were well illustrated by all this previous discussion. So, Emil. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in the 70s and uh, 80s, uh, I worked as a, a private, uh, in a private capacity as a consultant with policymakers on two uh, specific issues. Uh, one uh, was the West Bank and Gaza and the PLO leaders in Jerusalem, like Faisal Hosseini and others, and the relationship between them and PLO in order to facilitate that peace agreement ultimately. And the uh, second was the first few years of the Iran-Iraq war in Iraq, where uh, I went there several times to talk to uh, Iraqi leaders, Iraqi intellectuals, um, about their changing attitudes, not only just to, toward Iran, of course, but basically uh, toward the U.S. And of course, in, in, in 84, 83, 84, we reestablished uh, diplomatic uh, relations with, uh, with Iraq. And then um, at the end of that decade, early 90s, when uh, I went to the agency, I made the migration contrary to most senior people in government, they usually go to academia after they uh, have an illustrious career in government. I did it the other way, and that migration really was, was a very beautiful experience because of that expertise in, in those areas outside government and then in government. So when I uh, started there as a, a scholar in residence, the DCI passed through my office and he said, what is this scholar in residence? What do you do? I said, well, I sit, I talk to analysts, I brief policymakers, I look at our uh, intelligence research program for the year, and, um, and I write. And he said, and, and we pay you for that? <laughs> I said, damn right, Judge, you do. And then we started bas basically helping to build that type of expertise uh, in, in the region. Now, I had talked to a number when I worked on that little article I referred to in the previous uh, panel. I talked to a number of policymakers, but their reflection on uh, that war and what were the lessons that emerged and their experiences spe spe specifically in the 1970s. Now, as, as policymakers began to understand Sadat's uh, strategic political thinking, the policy became the driver and not intelligence during the, the 70s. In fact, the CIA during the 70s did not have uh, a good standing. Congress was screaming, Senator Church was screaming about the agency. The agency was not really uh, feeling good about itself and you have you have the 73 war and then right, of course, 88, 89, the fall of the Shah. So the agency in that fateful decade was really not a player. In fact, policy on, on those very important policies that emerged from the 73 war, policy makers were the driving uh, force rather than, rather than intelligence. And uh, to his credit, uh, Secretary Kissinger emerged as the key architect of the post-73 balance of power in the region and the, the, uh, of, of that structure 
in which he told the Israelis in no uncertain terms that our relationship with Israel was going to allow for two things, like it or not. One, to pursue a peace treaty with the Arabs, and two, Sadat becoming a key player in the search for peace. And that was as early as, as, as almost two, three days right after the war. And, and that continued, in a sense, with the following administration, in a sense, uh, uh, and, and ultimately uh, Camp David. Now, when I asked policymakers to identify the key issues which they consider, many of them, frankly, consider the 1970s, a very, very important decade in our policy in the region for the next 40 years. And they identified, of course, and, and Bill talked about that, the oil embargo and, and how to adjust to it. Uh, Bill mentioned about our understanding of oil and so on. But the other thing that we, we did not fully understand was the impact on, on the, uh, of the nationalization and the creation of OPEC on oil producing countries, and specifically on Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia in the late 60s, before even the war, established that proselytizing Islam was a weapon they were going to use against communism and Nasser's brand of Arab nationalism. And so they established the Muslim World League, they established IIRO, they established WAMI, they established Al Haramain, all as Islamic NGOs to serve Saudi Arabia's foreign policy objective. In fact, it was, it was uh, one of the principal objectives, cardinal objectives of, U of Saudi foreign policy was the use of Islam and the spread of Islam as a cardinal principle back in the late 60s. When you add that to the um, creation of OPEC, the whole attitude and power of oil producing countries changed. That, by the way, that was another area where, where when we looked at Saudi Arabia, we never thought that Saudi Arabia was going to use oil as a weapon because of all that uh, previous history. Um, the second was urgent US Soviet UN contacts for the purpose of ending the conflict and starting the peace process going. Uh, the third was the weapon supplies to Israel and how Kissinger and, and, and the president ultimately made that decision and that was used even by the administration to recalibrate our relations, uh, relationship with Israel to allow for Sadat in the mix. And uh, four was the search for a settlement of the Arab-Israeli conflict and the growing role of both, not just Sadat, but also Riyadh, that is the Saudi leadership. Um, fifth, the, all of that in, that in the early part of the 70s, opening new channels uh, of communication to, to Sadat. And six was the leadership and political dynamics that we began to understand both in Egypt, uh, in Syria, and in Israel. It was even a, a major change in the domestic political scene in Israel. For the first time by 77, we saw the end of the labor government in Israel, period. They never recovered from that. And we saw a new alliance of more conservative, more um, um, I guess poorer Israelis under Likud and Begin. And so Begin created a new alliance. We had been used to labor and in a sense almost kind of European way of thinking. Now we began to, to see a new way of thinking in Israel under, under the, the new government, which in a sense has continued throughout. Um, then we began to also uh, understand the ascending role of Saudi Arabia. I mean, the joke was that the uh, Kissinger's road to Jerusalem went through Riyadh. Uh, and, and that was because of the growing role of Saudi Arabia. And in a sense, all of those policies that were began to take root in the 70s almost governed our relations in the region for the next 40 years. 
Now, intelligence analysis really, especially the, the uh, economic analysis, really played a very good role in assessing, and I used to talk to a number of our senior economists in assessing the whole impact of the oil embargo, uh, the economic impact on country after country, and policymakers found that to be very, very useful. Uh, the, the whole analysis of, of economic, the, economic embargo, the oil embargo and the impact of that. Now, in talking to policymakers uh, after the 73 war, um, I came up with a few lessons which they, they themselves, a bunch of them, identified. One was Sadat's interest in waging a war with a political end in mind. That was a lesson that they said, you know, we have to learn more about it. And, and in a sense, using war as, as, as a, uh, a diplomacy by other means, we did not think that Sadat was really at that level pushing for those four, for those four political uh, goals. That is ending the occupation, reopening the Suez Canal, resolving the Arab-Israeli conflict, and establishing closer relations with the U.S. The second uh, lesson they identified was this denial and deception as, as being very critical factor in reading a leader's intentions. Uh, the third was before the war, the Saudis did, did not, as Bill indicated, view oil as a, as a uh, weapon, as a political weapon, but in fact, they, are, they, they reached that decision right during the war, especially after the airlift uh, to uh, Israel, and they began to use oil as a, as a political weapon. And uh, again, that was, we, we thought that was unlikely because of their position on Islam and against Arab nationals. Um, the the uh, last point uh, I, I want to make was that the 73 war really sowed the seeds for fundamental changes that rugged the region for the end, uh, not only through the end of the decade, but through the end of that, of that last century. Um, I think as a parting thought, I would say that despite our intelligence failure to anticipate Sadat's war moves, the major policies that were adopted in the 70s have had a huge impact that we are still talking about today and in a sense, what drove those policies in the 70s were policymakers rather than I intelligence analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Emil. Uh, Dr. Greg Treverton is going to Great. try and, in a very brief <laughs> amount of time to summarize the uh, lessons that we've learned and tried to apply in the 40 years since. Uh, thanks, sir. That's a tall order and not much time. Uh, I should admit that I am, have mostly studiously avoided the Middle East in my career, so I'm far from an expert. What I'd like to do is, as Fred suggested, reflect on this case as uh, about what it says for the broader process of relations between intelligence and policy. There I am a student and sometime practitioner. I'm also aware, though, of the famous line by Speaker Wright years ago during the long and contentious confirmation hearing of John Tower to be Secretary of Defense, Wright was asked what was going on, and he said, everything has been said, but not everyone has said it yet. So I hope uh, that my uh, reflections will, what I'd hope to do is pick up uh, three themes and end with one lesson. The first theme violates my favorite lines from W.H. Auden. Auden said, thou shalt not with statisticians sit nor commit a social science. My first theme is a bit of social science. Uh, I, through the years, bored many colleagues, probably including Charlie and Andy, with my distinction between puzzles and mysteries as intelligence problems. Puzzles are those things that have an answer. We just may not know it. It may be hidden from us. How many missiles the Soviet Union had. Lots of classic Cold War intelligence problems were puzzles. Those are distinguished from mysteries. Those are things that don't have an answer. Nobody knows the answer. They're contingent. They're iffy. They depend. It's dangerous to talk about warning in front of Charlie Allen, but I'd like to focus on the pre-war phase. 
I recognize that doing so in his presence is like talking about ark building with Noah. Uh, but uh, what, uh, what, in, what, what warning seeks to do, in my view, uh, all, of, all of mystery addressing is really Bayesian in the sense it's a process of taking essentially subjective judgments and trying to refine them in light of incoming evidence. That's particularly true of warning, and I think especially true of warning of war, where the effort is really to turn a mystery, will they attack, into a puzzle, and to do that by identifying indicators. The more of those indicators flash red, the higher you think the probability of war is. That's theme one. Theme two picks up from the conversation by Martha and others about assumption. I should say in parentheses my watchword about assumptions, which I've never been able to clean up, uh, comes from a former Pentagon colleague of mine. I've at least made it unsexist. The, the best version I can do of it is, assumption is the parent of fuck up. Um, <laughs> but I'm, uh, I want to pursue that point in a somewhat different way. Uh, the, I've come through the long career of thinking about intelligence and policy to think of intelligence as basically storytelling, uh, building and adjusting stories. I guess I would say it's Bayesian storytelling, but that uh, spoils the simplicity of storytelling. Um, without a story, new information just kind of hangs there, doesn't go anywhere. On the other hand, if the story becomes too widely believed, too firmly believed, it cuts off information. It's called, some, people, some people call it mindset, uh, concept. Uh, it tends to be at the root of most things we call an intelligence failure. So story is critical. Theme three is, in some ways, the opposite of a lot of our conversation today. I'm struck in this look at this case by uh, how the intelligence was not too bad, it was too good. There was almost too much of it. Uh, all of the efforts of deception we've talked about and Bill cataloged all the things on the other side that could have been indicators. Uh, Israel is obviously a big piece of it. Our relative deference to Israeli views, they should know their circumstances better than we do. Uh, I think that's a mistake we probably are less likely to make now. The P Bill also mentioned Ashok Marwan, the, the uh, agent the Israelis thought they had very close to the top. Um, I, I find him a fascinating case. He manages to be both admired in Israel as a spy and admired in Egypt as a purveyor of disinformation, I guess we'll argue forever about which it was. But as I read the case, he reinforced the story. The story here was Sadat won't start a war he can't win. And Marwan, as I read the case, reinforced that story because from him, the Israelis heard Sadat about Sadat's military disadvantages. He doesn't, he's worried about is, Israeli air superiority, and until he gets longer range fighters and better scuds from the Soviets, he won't attack. So while he may have warned at the very 11th hour or 12th hour, for most of the case, it seems to me, he reinforced the story. Until Israel, and by extension us, saw the Soviets providing those things to Egypt, there could be no war. The lesson I draw from this is, in some ways, the stronger and more pervasive the story, the more important it is to look at what evidence you have. Most of the time, I think American intelligence is too focused on collection and information and not enough on thought. But here, I think it's very uh, important to look at the information. Because you would have had to take seriously the possibility of invasion. You would have had to say, all these indicators suggest maybe there is going to be a war to get into the set of questions that Martha outlined, those contextual factors that might have taken you to, oh, yeah, there are some reasons why he might start a war he can't win. But to crack through that story would have required, I think, really looking hard and taking seriously the possibility that he, there might, all those indicators of war might be real. Let me conclude with just a couple other examples of places where I think the same thing is true. Charlie's successor as NIO for warning, a woman named Mary McCarthy was active during the peso crisis in Mexico in 1995. And what she was doing was looking at the data. Uh, 
you kept looking at Mexican reserves and saying, they're going down, down, down. These people are going to have to devalue. Well, she got countered by all these complicated stories from Wall Street and Treasury about Teso Bonos and all these other things. It turned out in the end, the Mexicans were lying about their reserves. They were even worse than the published statistics. And in the end, they devalued. The way to cut through the story that the Wall Streeters and Treasury folks had was to pay hard attention to the data, to the numbers, to what you had. Finally, uh, coming back to, I can't resist coming back to uh, Iraqi WMD, which Andy talked about a lot. I'm a rather an admirer of Don Rumsfeld, but whatever you think about his line about the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, it's a clear statement of anti-Bayesian position, right? Because in a Bayesian sense, every day that, that the inspectors didn't find anything, we should have raised, in a Bayesian sense, our subjective probability that he didn't have any. Uh, so while Don is admirable on many fronts, as a Bayesian, he's not. Uh, but it illustrates the challenge. In that case, the mindset was so pervasive, the story was so strong, even held by governments that weren't going to go to war or people that thought the war a bad idea like me. Uh, very hard, but it does seem to me it takes us back to the importance of really focusing on what data there is available, all the more so the stronger the story at play is. Thank you. Thank you. We accelerated uh, a bit here in order to allow at least 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes worth of questions. Uh, so whoever has the microphone, are there any hands? Um, do you see something there, Ian? Got a question right here in the middle. Uh, raised in the energy business and uh, energy question. This is important. Um, it might have a lot to do with defusing the Saudi issue. Should oil fall with some new uh, formations we're working in the states to say $55, maybe even 50, but possibly 60 as well? What impact would that have? Uh, Emil, possibly, on the, the strength, the roots uh, of uh, the Saudis uh, and all their Wahhabism and all that sort of thing? Well, th that's a, um, an important question that also was raised in Global Trends 2030. One of the um, points um, uh, that was raised there was about the future of energy, uh, and particularly the changes in the prices of, of, of of oil. Now, the question of Saudi Arabia, we've discussed that question at length, but was not included fully in, in uh, GT 2030. What is... Now, what he's referring to is an unclassified uh, view of the future prepared by the National Intelligence Council, and that unclassified document, I believe, is on dni.gov or cia.gov, right. one or the other. Yeah, thank you. Um, most now recent reports point to Saudi Arabia that by 2028, and this is two years before even 2030, that Saudi Arabia would become a net oil importer. If that is even extremely exaggerated, there is a more consensus that Saudi Arabia by 2028 would become a very, very small oil exporter. The reason is that they would need eight to nine million barrels a day for domestic consumption, power generation, and desalination. Now the question is, if funds begin to decrease, would Saudi Arabia by then be able to spend, as they did last year in 2011, $133 billion to silence their opposition at home? That's a, that's a key question. And secondly, for the U.S., would they, especially if the U.S. and Iran reach some sort of, of a settlement of, the, of this issue, would the Saudis continue to need large, vast, uh, large amounts of weapons?
and weapon systems from the U.S. And thirdly, would Saudi Arabia, since the proselytization or dawah of Islam has become a key principle of their Saudi policy, foreign policy, would they have enough funds to continue to fund these activities worldwide? So these are three very important questions, even aside from a drop in the price of oil. Next question. This question's right here. I haven't used a microphone in a long time. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I have listened through the dialogue and we have heard continually that our intelligence has gotten better and better and better. Um, when I think about Benghazi, it makes me question, is it good enough now? Do we have another 40 years that we need to go before we can really feel safe? And I'm not saying that critical, it's just a question that pops into my head when I hear of all the progress you've made in 40 years. Did it stop in 2010, 11? I mean, what, where do we need to go here? I'm not sure that Benghazi is a test of uh, a decades long slow improvement. Um, I think a personal opinion here that the Benghazi issue is less a measure of the uh, effectiveness of collection, analysis, and dissemination of intelligence than it is policy, various policymakers' reaction to that policy. I think that the hearings, the public hearings in Congress, pretty much settled on the fact that at least three subordinate levels of state in the Bureau of Diplomatic Security decided, perhaps in a very short-sighted way, that our budget had not allowed for increased security in Benghazi and Tripoli. And until things get worse, until we get more money, we're not going to change it. So uh, there we are with that one. I said a word, Fred. Please. Uh, I think on Benghazi, I, I share Fred's sense my sense as a close outsider is that uh, the intelligence community has gotten better over the last couple decades. Uh, and that's, you know, it doesn't mean that we won't be surprised. We'll be surprised. Sure, we're going to be surprised. That's the nature of life. Uh, what we can try and do is build hedges, get as much warning as we can, think about a changing world. But it is a, a complicated and rapidly changing world. The other point I guess I would make, though, is on the other side is that we've been through now, what, a dozen years when intelligence has been really very dominated by war fighting. And that does leave us in a uh, position where the question's about can we understand these deeper mysteries of where Arab Spring is going, where China is going? Uh, are we building that kind of capacity in the intelligence community? The answer is for the last decade and a half, we haven't really, and that's a challenge before us. Uh, another question. I can't see against these lights. Uh, perhaps over here, uh, Ian, uh, you have a microphone. Uh, my, uh, you've got a question here. Um, yes, it's kind of, uh, I don't know how to. It, no, you're going to have to speak know. directly into that mic. Okay, sorry. Um, what I'm concerned about is on the East Coast, well, we have the British Petroleum um, leak, the oil leak, and then I'm worried about Japan, the nuclear um, problem we have there. So we're basically in the middle, the United States, but it's affecting the whole world. What I'm curious about is how come we're worried about the cost of oil? What, what should be a concern of the cost of oil when we've got a worldwide problem with the water? What are we going to do about the oceans? What, I'm just curious, why is it a matter to everyone else to be worried about the cost of oil well, uh, that's going to be kind of, it's a rather difficult question to weave into this uh, particular discussion. But as uh, the price of oil goes down, uh, perhaps there's um, going to be less fracking, uh, if that's uh, your particular issue. Uh, I'm not sure that I have a direct connection to the level of the ocean at the moment. But uh, 
let's hold that off until we get another conference on uh, some of these uh, global economic and environmental issues. Uh, do we have another question back Mr. here? Mr. Hutchins, right here in the back. All right, question for you guys. I'll lighten it up for you and make it a little more theoretical. How difficult is it for you, the policy analyst, to believe the data collector, the information that you're getting from them? Is it difficult to switch your mind over and actually believe face value what you're seeing from a collection standpoint? How, how does he cope with his own mindset? Uh, let me take a try at that. I mean, I think there is a certain kind of information that uh, you take very seriously, and it tends to be of the more technical variety, which we're actually pretty good at now. We get overhead pictures that are just as good as you can get on Google Earth, which is pretty good. <laughs> that didn't exist 40 years ago. So, you know, pictures, and we intercept a lot of stuff, and you get to read people's mail, and you take all of that pretty seriously. The problem is, it often doesn't answer the question that you're most interested in, which is, what's in the back of their mind? Or, what do all the people whose mail we're not reading, like we did read the Shaw's mail and his you know, communication with his ambassadors, and he thought everything was just fine on the eve of the revolution. What we weren't reading was what ordinary Iranians were thinking and feeling. And so, there are certain kinds of knowledge you want to know that the intelligence people don't know, what's really going on in Saddam Hussein's mind, uh, and nobody else knows. And his own, the own people around him don't know. And so, as, as Greg said, there, those are the kind of things you really want answers to. Um, but you have to have a very high level of, um, high standard of, of, of veracity for anything people tell you. Oh, I know what he has in mind. Well, how do you know it? I mean, none of us knows how to read other people's minds. And often that is really what you want to know. Uh, so I would say, yes, you get kind of hooked on the technical stuff. And that you take very seriously. But before going to Camp David in 1978, we got so-called psychological profiles done by quite competent people about Sadat and Begin. By that time, I had met Begin and Sadat. The analyst never had. I must say, I didn't read it with a great deal of interest because it didn't tell me anything that I really wanted to know, what's their strategy going to be. It told me a little bit about their childhood, most of that I knew. But I had actually spent hours and hours and hours in meetings with them and thought, actually, I probably have a better sense of what these guys are like and what they're thinking than the analysts. So you get fairly discriminating about, yes, this is a good category, and you kind of know the people doing that, and other things where people are fee feeding you. And you'll, you'll get this out of the documents if you have the patience to read them. A lot of them you'll read through and just say, gosh, why would anybody pay any attention? This is just summaries of conventional wisdom. And it goes over and over and over. It's always the same. And that's stuff you get pretty uninterested in very quickly as a consumer. Uh, Mr. Hutchinson, we have Ian. a next question right here in the middle. Good evening, gentlemen. Um, I just want to talk, ask about something that you guys mentioned earlier about uh, that this was a failure driven by policymakers as opposed to intelligence analysts. So my question to you guys is, do you feel there has been um, any changes as far as the story being told by the analyst? Are the policymakers now telling their stories to the analysts as well to get a better picture of what's really going on? Or is this still like an ongoing issue where policymakers know certain things that analysts don't and they just don't share with the analyst? And a second question, sir, Mr. Treverton, uh, what is this Banzai sentence you were talking about? If you can elaborate on that a little bit. Thank you. Benzai. I'm sorry. Thank Benzai. you. Oh, okay. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on the first question, I think, I think all of us would think that the failure in 73 was one shared by intelligence and policy, that they all believed the same story, uh, and it was hard to break through that story. Uh, if you mean story not in the capital S sense that I tend to use it, then I think some of the things we've talked about are, have gotten better, but it's still the case that, that policy is not very good at debriefing intelligence when it has meetings, so you get leaders that are always saying to intelligence briefers, well, that's not what he said to me. I talked to him 30 minutes ago. Or if you only knew. If only you knew. 
so that, and, and that's worse the more contact that's going on. It's one of the reasons that negotiations are often hard to support because the negotiators feel they know better than any intelligence analyst what's happening. They may like anecdotes or tidbits or bits of, uh, of biography of their counterparts but aren't likely to look for intelligence otherwise. The, the Bayesian sense, Bayes, you know, Bayes is a Bayes theorem, it's a mathematical theorem, but the, I mean it in the sense of adjusting essentially subjective prob probabilities um, with evidence. So if you flip a coin, your starting probability is that it's going to be equally likely to come heads, up, up heads and tails. You get two heads in a row, doesn't change that much. Three heads in a row, you begin to doubt whether it's a fair coin. Five or six and seven, you begin to say, this may not be a fair coin. So that's the process, basically updating what are essentially subjective assessments around these mysteries as new evidence comes in. So in the WMD case, every day the inspectors didn't find WMD. We should have been more willing to entertain the proposition that there weren't any to find. But that ran into the big story, the capital S story about Saddam Hussein. May, may I say a word? Please. Um, <clears throat> the agency has improved significantly in terms of the analysis, especially since the uh, infamous curveball <laughs> case with the, with the Iraq war. And that is now you have to assess the, the source, the access, the information, the knowledge of that person how close that person is to the source, and these were generated since curveball. And so now, when you write something, you have to say, and you make a judgment, not only the level of confidence, we've, which we've always had to do that, but now, if you are quoting a certain source, you have to, to say the type of access that source has, the type of knowledge, if you have a source reporting on, on uh, uh, physical, physics and that source doesn't know a thing about physics, well then you have to question the source. And so not only the access, but also the knowledge that that person has. And so that's really developed more clearly and as, as systematically since the Iraq war. We have another question. Mr. Hutchinson, right down here to your left. Uh, I had brought this up in a previous, uh, briefly, conversation with Mr. Knockley, but of course we have the, the IQ, the EQ, emotional quotient, and then the, the spiritual quotient uh, paradigm, which perhaps it seems like was a factor with the 73 Arab-Israeli war, and even today with the Middle East um, concerns and issues. How much of an influence um, is that assessment uh, having um, in the discussions now, and even perhaps more so in the future as to how that should be improved or even advanced further? Is that in the discussions uh, now and as opposed to our Western th thought uh, based on Western thinking? You fellows have a grip on that one. I mean, the only comment I would make is that unless the person, whether he is a, a Christian, a Muslim, a Buddhist, unless that person prefaces their policy approach or their statements about specific policies with their understanding or interpretation of their own religion, I would not pay much attention uh, to that at all. I mean, if leaders plan and pursue their national interests, unless specifically that person, as Saudi Arabia did in the 60s when they established the spread of Islam as part, a cardinal uh, principle in their foreign policy, I would not really pay much attention to the role of theology or religion in that. Do we have another question? Ian? Right over here. Okay. Uh, from the 1973 Arab-Israeli War, Israel acquired a lot of occupied territory. What is the future of that territory? Who is going to eventually claim ownership? <laughs> own ownership and also that they want this territory. I mean, uh, it was negotiated, um, Egypt took back the Sinai and they didn't want Gaza. So what's gonna happen to the other territory? I, I, from all my readings, I think Israel is willing to negotiate those territories and wants to give up, I don't know how much, maybe all of it, to be negotiated, but 
I don't feel like there's any takers. Is, is this like a ping pong ball or is it actually, what's gonna happen to let it me, Let me give you future? a couple of simplify, overly simplified points. First of all, the United States position is that the continued occupation of territory conquered in war is a violation of international law and we do not recognize Israel's rights to continue to occupy that territory. It's a legal position. The United States government position also has been for years that if the two parties, the Palestinians and the Israelis, can come to an agreement on land swaps or just give up some land, whatever they agree to, we will honor, uh, we will support them in that agreement. Um, you fellows want to add anything to that? I think if we knew the future, we'd be laying big bets. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is probably worth another conference, not, uh, yeah, I not think the tail the, end of it. There, there's, a, there's a lot more to be said there. And if you want to get a better feel for that, uh, read the English language Israeli press. And you're going to find that the Israeli press presents <laughs> a different national perspective on the issue of, quote, in Israeli terms. Should we continue to hold this land or not? There seems to be more of a view in this country that is sympathetic to an Israeli trend to hold on to the territory. Uh, that's, uh, you won't find that in a wide variety of Israeli press. Um, it says if it, they have a better view, I think, of their country than many of their sympathizers here do. Uh, another question? Uh, Ian? Right. We have our right final here. question. If we can make it a quick one right over here to your left. Yes, we're about at the end, so let's make this the final. It should be, it should be quick. Um, on the, uh, the Egyptians were in control or, or doing very well for about the first uh, 10 days or so. That flight of the SR-71 uh, gave you, I think, the first real look at what was happening along the canal. Is that information directly exchanged with Israel, and did that turn things the other way? Well, in terms of sharing information, if information is shared for our national interest, that doesn't mean we share everything. Uh, in that case, uh, unless someone has uh, a sharper recollection of it than I, uh, I don't know that we shared all of those pictures. I think we shared some information from it. I think we also discussed that information with the Egyptians, as I recall. Just a quick answer is the, the fate of uh, the Egyptian uh, forces in the Sinai was probably determined on October 13th, when for the first time, Egyptian tank formations moved out of the protection they had uh, under the missiles along the canal and moved deep into the Sinai in an offensive meant to take some pressure off the Syrian front where the Israelis were really mopping up. Uh, and at that point, they lost hundreds of tanks almost immediately. And at that point, the Israelis realized that they had an opportunity to drive them not only back, but also to break through their lines. And that happened before the SR-71. It happened actually before the first American uh, airlift equipment had arrived. So although the, the Egyptian story tends to be that their near defeat in Sinai was caused by the airlift and perhaps sharing of intelligence, uh, the truth is that they took a risk. They went out from under the cover of their surface-to-air missiles, and they got clobbered, which is the old model of Israel does very well in the air against tanks that aren't defended by uh, surface-to-air missiles, which was the experience of 1967, and it was repeated in Sinai once they made their offensive move. That's what really happened. Well, that wraps up this uh, section, and uh, I think it's uh, time to thank my colleagues here for their contributions, and thank you for your questions. Joe Lambert, uh, if you please.
Thank you, Fred. I have the opportunity to, uh, the pleasure to close this conference in uh, a couple minutes or less. My name is Joe Lambert. I'm the Director of Information Management at CIA, and along with my deputy, Dan Sullivan, we have the responsibility for all agency records, the entirety of the agency archives, and all declassification and release decisions that are rendered at CIA. Typically, the first question a director of the Central Intelligence Agency will ask me is, Joe, how do you or how do we decide when a secret is no longer a secret? And that's a very complicated and difficult decision, one I'm reminded of every time I visit headquarters and walk into the main lobby. I walk across the iconic seal in the tile floor. I walk past the statue of William Donovan from OSS on the left. Continuing, I walk past our memorial wall on the right, where there's a star there for every CIA officer that's lost their life in the line of duty. Uh, since I've been there 29 years, I've watched tw uh, 49 stars chiseled into that wall. I continue on, go up a few steps, and off to the left, there is a mural of the Statue of Liberty. Below that mural is printed the CIA motto, and it reads, we are the nation's first line of defense. We accomplish what others can't accomplish, and we go where others can't go. There are two things that factor into this difficult decision to decide when a secret's no longer a secret. On one hand, we at CIA don't own these records. We hold them in trust for the American people. And when their sensitivity attenuates over time, we have an obligation to declassify and release these records so the public can judge for themselves the effectiveness of their government, and in particular, the CIA. On the other hand, we have to do that in a way that preserves our ability to discharge our mission, to remain the nation's first line of defense. Fortunately, we have some very dedicated officers at CIA that take up that challenge every day. It takes a long time to put together an event like today's event, uh, in fact, our folks have been working on the declassification of these documents for the better part of the last year. One of the most satisfying parts of my job is I get to watch skilled officers, and in this case, folks like Bruce Barkin and Peter Nyron of Historical Collections Division and their colleagues, uh, Matt Penny and uh, historians from the Center for the Study of Intelligence. They get to bring these really compelling stories from the CIA's archives to life and so that the public can see them. CIA officers are not used to uh, public acknowledgement of their work, but I offer a very ha heartfelt thanks uh, to all those folks from the Historical Collections Division and the Center for the Studies of Intelligence for the wonderful work that went into today's event. And I believe that Paul Wormser showed you the document that was put together in the very beginning. I will had three comments about the DVD that he held up. For those of you that might be watching on home, the contents of this DVD will be available on CIA.gov. If it's not there already, it will be very shortly. Second, the DVD is divided into three sections. One section holds the document collections. Another section holds a multimedia file that has a plethora of photographs, among other things. And the third section is just simply background material. And most importantly, because I'm going to get about 50 to 100 phone calls at my office in Washington, this DVD is designed for use in your computer and not the DVD player hooked up to your television. <laughs> Let me say that one more time. It's designed for the computer, not the TV. Let me thank Paul Wormser, the Deputy Director of the Nixon Library, and uh, Sandy Quinn of the Foundation for making this spectacular venue, the replica of the East Room of the White House, available to showcase the declassification and release of these CIA documents. Uh, I want to also thank a couple other people in the audience, one in particular, a friend of mine, Peter Yasowski, who's the Director for the Center for the Studies of Intelligence. Uh, for his continued support over the years. And all the wonderful speakers and panelists that we've had here today, I think it's been an outstanding event. I want to thank C-SPAN for their coverage. And finally, on behalf of our acting director, Michael Morell, and the CIA officers that are present here today and those that aren't back at Langley, I want to offer you a thank you very much to each of you who have attended today's event. With that, we have a couple of tokens we'd like to exchange really quickly. So, uh, Paul, if I could invite you and Sandy uh, back up to the podium. It is a little lucite block of the what you actually see on your screen here. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. Oh, Sandy, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we have one more. And could uh, Dane from AFIO please come up, the Association of uh, Former Intelligence Officers. They are constantly supporting these events, so we actually have one for uh, him as well. 
and the uh, honor falls to me to present a uh, uh, plaque oh, also. Well. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Um, this conference has really been spectacular, and working with the with uh, Joe and his staff, in particular Peter Nyron and Bruce Barkin, has been an absolute pleasure. I think they've done a fantastic job. I think this is a very important type of event. There are a few few nations on this earth that will examine so-called failures of their own government in such a public way. And I have to applaud that. And I want to present this to Joe and Thank with you. our thanks. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our afternoon. And all of you are invited into the main lobby where we'll have a, a brief reception. So thank you all for coming.